so much for that warm welcome. It is so good to be here. So good to be here on the, uh, the Brighton Dome stage. Uh, what a cool place to be. And uh, thank you so much for the, uh, the, the um, invite to be here, Danny. Uh, Danny actually invited me to join for the 2020 edition of UX Brighton. And I guess you all know how that went down. It didn't. I mean, I actually want to give some credit to Danny and his crew because, I mean, they've been trying to put this show on, this, this, this particular event, for a couple of years now and hasn't been able to. So the fact that this thing has actually been going on today, huge round of applause, credit to Danny and his crew. Thank you all for being here. Right, so I heard there's a bunch of people here from not around here, but who here is from Brighton itself? All right, hello, Brighton. Cool, and who here is from Hove, actually? <laughs> All right, hey, Hove. I actually just moved from Brighton to Hove, like, over the summer. I'm starting to, I think I'm starting to get a handle as to why they call it Hove, actually. I'm not quite sure I understand. Maybe some of you Hovians can explain in the break. Hovians. Can we call it that? I don't know. Hovites? <laughs> I don't know, we'll have to come up with a word for this, or maybe there is a word, I'll have to learn it. Um, and who here is from abroad? Who, who, who here is, doesn't know what I'm talking about when I say Brighton and Hove? Yeah, okay. <laughs> right. Well, when we were little, we often talked about what we wanted to be when we grew up. You know, some of us maybe wanted to be teachers, or firefighters, or astronauts, or UX content designers. <laughs> But did we ever stop to talk about what we wanted our companies to be when they grew up? You know, there's a lot of ways to make a profitable, respectable, great business. But if we're not deliberate about the choices that we make when we're building our business, it's very easy to build something that might not turn out to be exactly what we expected it to be. And the best way to find out what kind of company it is that you're building is to take a look at what it is that you actually sell as a business. You know, this is the best way to tell if you're actually more of a product company or an agency. Because agencies sell their time in exchange for money. And this usually comes in the form of client contracts and projects. Whereas product companies, well, they create value that they sell. Now, time is the one thing that we can't get more of. It's the ultimate unlimited resource. And so this is why you end up with Agencies, if you want to scale an agency, you have to bring in more people. You want to get a little bit more profit into that company. You want to do more client projects. You need more people to do so. And so if you want to have a, a bigger profitable agency, you need a bigger agency. Whereas a product company, if that wants to scale, you don't necessarily need more people. You just need more products to sell. You can actually create more value and sell more of those products without having a proportionally larger number of people to do so. And so this is why you end up with product companies that become these tech giants. And you don't see agencies of that sort of scale. Now, there's nothing wrong with building an agency. It's a perfectly good way of making money, making impact, making ways of um, solving problems in the world. But agencies don't change the world. Product companies do. Now, I should probably introduce myself. My name's Jenna Basto. You might know me as one of the founders of Mind the Product, which is the world's largest community of product people. You also might know me as one of the founders of ProdPad, which is the software for product teams. It's a tool that allows you to build your roadmap and uh, collect your OKRs and ideas and feedback and put it all together so that you end up building the right thing and don't end up building the wrong thing and taking your team off track. Now, many years ago, I was a product manager, and I joined a company as a product manager quite some time ago, and it was within the first week that I realized that I wasn't actually going to be doing product management for this particular company. I was going to be doing project management, and this is because this company had signed up to do a whole bunch of client work. They'd had this product platform that was what sold me on the vision, but in reality, when I looked at what their commitments were, I was just going to be sort of shepherding these projects through, and that's what was going to be filling my time. Now, this company hadn't knowingly missold me on the job. They'd been caught in this trap that I now know is pretty common. And so I want to tell you about this trap, what I call the agency trap, 
and I want to give you the signs that you're veering into it, and I want to show you how to get out of it if you're in it already. So, today's talk is going to be a journey. We've already talked about the power of being a product company versus an agency. We're also going to talk about reasons why you might get pulled off track, things that might distract you. We're also going to talk about signs that you're veering into this agency mode, signs that you're being pulled into this agency trap. And also, how to get out. So, are we ready, UX Brighton? Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> so, so many teams start off with this idea that they're going to be doing this learning, iterating, pushing forward, and you know, coming up with something that's going to you know, hockey stick growth them up. But they're at the beginning of the hockey stick, right? They're learning, they're iterating, they're getting going. And any day now, they're going to be taking off. But it's very easy for them to get distracted. They, they you know, as Danny said, they, they see a, 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 a client coming in with um, some, some custom idea that they want to get built or something like that. And they end up getting distracted and pulled off track. And the company ends up sputtering and failing in their goals. So what is happening here? Well, one thing to remember is that it takes time to build a product company. It can take months and years to get to the point where you've actually got a product that actually pays for the investment that you put into the business itself. And so sometimes taking on pieces of work that keep the lights on, pay for payroll, you know, that's tempting. That sometimes looks like easy work. I can understand why companies will go and take on work like this. Cash is king at the end of the day pays the bills. And sometimes it's driven by your marketing or your sales or some exec who is pulling in those deals. They're coming back from talking to the market at large and they're saying, oh, I just talked to this client. And they said, if we just built this one feature here, they would definitely buy. If we bought this one feature right, right here, we, they would definitely buy. And it's always one more feature away, right? Never quite there, but it's always these one more features, one after the other after the other, that tends to distract us from building something for the wider market that's going to solve those problems and allow us to get that takeoff that we're looking for. And sometimes it's those enterprise customers. We all love having those big, juicy logos on our lovely SaaS homepages, but those big enterprise customers often come with big enterprise requirements, right? And so oftentimes, by taking in these requirements, it can distract us from building something for the wider market. And solving for that wider market is exactly what's going to help us uh, 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 solve the bigger problems for our business down the line. And sometimes it's purely a lack of focus. You know, if, if your team hasn't actually said that they're focused on building something for this wider market, they're solving uh, something for a, um, uh, not just taking on whatever jobs, then why wouldn't they just take on whatever jobs? You know, after all, these particular uh, tasks pay the bills. Why not? So sometimes it's just a lack of focus that leads people to just take on whatever work. And sometimes, this one's the most painful, it's because the company's been funded early on. They take in this funding, and this funding is meant to get them to the point that the company is sustainable or can get to that next round of funding. And it's supposed to get them there, but sometimes it takes that little bit longer. They're a day late, a dollar short. And so they end up filling that gap with custom pieces of work, with pieces of work that pay the bills in the meantime. But by doing those pieces of work in the meantime, it distracts them from the things that are going to allow them to get that lift off, that traction that they need to show to the investors that gets them that next round. And so you get companies who end up stuck in these ruts that never actually get to that next round in the first place. You know, every company starts off with this idea that they want to do the scientific method of measuring and learning and iterating and building the most feasible, desirable, valuable product out there. But in times of stress, sometimes, whatever we need to do to get to the next round becomes selling your time for money. <coughs> and it's easy to get stuck. Because, let's be honest, making money and cash and checks is addictive. 
But remember, every minute of time that you sell to a client to build one of their custom problems, to solve their specific problems, is a minute that you can't spend solving problems for the wider market that's gonna help you as a business. Now, it's possible, there's a chance that they have done the discovery and found a problem that you could take and resell over and over and over again. A lot of people have this idea that that's what they're going to do, but I've seen this before, and it, it usually doesn't work that way. Most of the time, you haven't leapfrogged years and years of discovery. Chances are you are just going to be taking on work from client A, and it's gonna be solving their problem and not problems for everybody else. Um, chances are uh, you're better off finding something for the wider market and doing that discovery yourself and not outsourcing it to clients. So one clear sign that you can look at to see when you're veering into agency mode. One thing I always look at in companies to see what's going on. Let's take a look at roadmaps. I love looking at roadmaps because when you look at roadmaps, you can see what's going on in the company. I believe that roadmaps are a diagnostic tool for the company. Basically, show me your roadmap and I can tell you what's wrong with the company. I'll show you some examples. So let's say your roadmap is written as a whole bunch of solutions or feature level things. Well, this tells me that you probably don't have that much autonomy, right? The team doesn't have much say in how they're gonna go about solving various problems. They're just being told, here's a bunch of things to go do, go do. Or how about this one? What if uh, you go in and the company doesn't have a roadmap or a vision or a strategy written out? Well, this gives me a pretty clear sign that the team is probably lacking alignment somewhere, right? Or what about when the roadmap is dictated from above? The execs have basically just said, here is the roadmap. You don't have a say in this. You can't change this. There's no room for questions or experiments. This gives a clear sign that there's a lack of psychological safety. So what about seeing a clear sign of a, 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 a team who's trapped in this agency trap? Well, clear sign is having a sales-led roadmap. And I know what a sales-led roadmap looks like because I've built one before. This is my old roadmap. This is my roadmap from that company that I joined where I was a product, though, project manager. And you can see there's a couple distinct areas in it. The gray stuff is the discovery-led work that we're building for this B2C market. You know, if we, if we tackled this, everyone is gonna use this product and is gonna take off and we're gonna take over the world. The green stuff is what paid the bills. This is the stuff that was actually driven by the salespeople. And if you actually take a look at the stuff that had happened before the snapshot of this roadmap was taken, if you take a look at that line there, um, that's the, the present day. And if you look at what was happening before then, there was very little happening on the discovery side. Very little happened for the uh, wider market. Most of the work went into partner launches and enterprise work. Now, it looks as if maybe some of that space in the partner launches area sort of cleared up for us. It looked as if maybe there was going to be room to start working on stuff for the wider market. But... I can tell you it never did. Going forward with this roadmap, we never did find time for that because every time we found a moment, the salespeople would come back with this grin on their face and tell me what they had sold to the next client and I would end up having to go build it. We'd just gotten to this habit of just building for the next client. Ultimately, we never got back to building for the wider market. Ultimately, this business failed. And what if you're in an interview situation? You're trying to figure out if you're about to join a company that is in an agency trap. Ask them to look at the roadmap. They should be able to show you a roadmap. If they don't, that's a bad sign. Uh, ask to look at the roadmap and ask who owns the roadmap. Ask who edits the roadmap. Ask when the last time the roadmap changed. Ask where things on the roadmap came from. Just pry a little bit about how the roadmap operates within the business and what kind of say you'll have in the roadmap. And it'll give you an idea as to whether it's a flexible roadmap that's discovery-led or something a little bit more sales-led. So I see a bunch of you nodding along. I think some of you might be in the agency trap. 
It's okay, we've all been there. We're gonna talk about how to get out of it. So the first step, acknowledge it and have the tough conversations. You've gotta get the people in the room and uh, talk about the sacrifices that have been made. Acknowledge it and talk about the outcomes that it's gonna have for the business if you keep down this path. And along that conversation, ask the question, what kind of company do we want to be? Now you might actually discover as part of this conversation that maybe the company does actually want to be an agency. Maybe you've been misunderstood all along and so you need to realign your expectations. Maybe that's okay, maybe that's not okay, but it's good to know now before you, know, you get a little bit too deep in. Or maybe the company actually does have expectations that they are gonna be taken off. You know, they're at the bottom of the hockey stick and they're expecting that it's all gonna go well in three months time. And maybe you're enlightening them that it's not. Unless they give you time for this discovery and research work that you need to do, it's not gonna magically do that if, you, if they keep selling, you know, January to this client and February to this client and March to the next client. You need to enlighten them on that and you might be able to save the business. Maybe there's actually a strategic reason they're doing it this way. Maybe they're actually avoiding uh, uh, getting a, um, a down round or um, taking in funding that wouldn't be healthy for the business by taking in client stuff that pays for the, the bills and allows, buys you time to do the right work. You know, maybe it's a healthy step that they're taking. And as long as it's done for the right reasons, it's not necessarily the worst idea. But just make sure that the team understands what's happening and it's done with the understanding as to what sacrifices are being made and how much. Now, really importantly is that it is possible to have a product company and agency style work at the same time. I bet some of you already operate in this way and it can be done healthily, but you need to separate the two. The two have competing interests, essentially, because if you separate the two, you can have a product unit who's building for the future, who's building for the, 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 the wider market, and the agency side of the team is using the assets that the product team is coming up with and upselling it to all these other clients. Now, the key here is that the agency team has their own resources. They're not macking off the product team because that means the product team can operate. And the other key thing is that the agency team charges completely different than the product team. One of the big faux pas I see is product teams charging a little bit for their product tool, right? SaaS teams tend to charge like a little nice base price. And then when they get some custom work, they go, oh, well, you know, how much could this cost to do some custom work? I don't know, 10K? That's, that's probably not enough. Make it 100K, add some zeros. Don't be afraid to charge more because worst case scenario, what's this client going to do? Say no? Remember that they're asking for custom work on top of a product that you have built. You are singularly pretty much the only development team in the world who could build this because you've built the platform that they wanna build it on top of. If you've got a great product, you can build the great thing on top of it and charge handsomely for it. So don't be afraid of doing so. Worst case scenario, they don't buy it off you, but you end up getting clients who do buy it off you. Focus on those clients who will buy off you. So don't be afraid to separate the two, charge accordingly, and get paid for the time that you're putting into it if you are selling your time, because time is the ultimate limited resource. And then over time, start decreasing your dependence on this agency cash. If you have the aspirations of being a product company, then take a look and measure it out. Say, well, maybe we're doing 80% agency style project led cash right now and 20% product led cash, that's fine. But how can we get it to 70-30? How long would it take us to get to 50-50? And so work out a plan in your strategy to bring it to that and uh, work with your team to understand what that would look like. And if you've got a sales led roadmap, I hugely encourage you to ditch that roadmap move away from that format because what it does, it encourages you to constantly look at which features are gonna be delivered for who and when and never really take a step back and say, which problems are we trying to solve and why? So if you've got a format that looks like this, all it's really telling you is here's what's being delivered and when and here's the features that are being done. At the end of the day, what you get with this is a whole bunch of features delivered. And everyone knows that a whole bunch of features delivered does not necessarily make the best product. 
step away from this format and move to something more like this, a discovery-led roadmap. And a discovery-led roadmap looks like this. It has problems to be solved. It's linked to high-level objectives. It's organized in terms of the order in which you need to solve things rather than when they need to be solved. And it takes the focus off when things are done and more around what can be done with the resources you have. It takes the focus off when things are going to be done and what has to be done and uh, what can be done with the resources that you have and uh, the problems that need to be solved and how your team can solve them together. Now, I understand that moving away from a timeline roadmap can be painful. I have worked with literally hundreds, maybe thousands of teams now um, through ProdPed to uh, move away from timeline roadmaps to this more timeline version, uh, so this more discovery-led version. So I've written this guide on how to ditch this timeline roadmap, and it has a, uh, a page specifically on the end on how to convince your stakeholders. Specifically, you've got execs, uh, investors, sales, marketing people, customers. Um, so uh, uh, whatever their objections are, we've got help on how to get them on board with a leaner way of working like this, a more discovery-led way of working like this. And I also know how important it is to have uh, examples as well. So we have a sandbox here that shows you example roadmaps, uh, example OKRs, and how it all plays together. So jump in there. You don't need login details or credit card or anything like that. You can just jump in and start playing around. Really useful if you want to show people examples of this working before you set off on the journey of creating your own. Now, really key thing is you don't have to go product. Right? I'm not anti-agency. Agencies are a great way to make money and have an impact and run a great business. I just don't want people here to fall into the trap that my old business did when it ultimately went under, which was being a product company that fell into the trap of having agency work that dragged it down into this pit. Don't fall into this really common startup killer, which is the agency trap. Most importantly, as you're building up your company, simply ask yourself, what kind of company do I want to grow up to be? And so with that, I want to say thank you, and I want to give you the slides here that you can grab a copy of. Uh, I also have the slides actually here on the next slide, which is probably more important, because you can reach me. If you have any questions at all, um, uh, reach out to me. I'm always happy to chat to you. Find me on LinkedIn or Twitter or Mastodon now, I guess. Um, thank you very much, UX Brighton. Have a great day.